Tastemakers was funded in part by... In the hands of those who take pride in what they do, something unique can be created. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. And by Fleischmann's Yeast. And A.B. Mowry. Biodynamic farming is inspired by the biodiversity found in nature, and in this episode of Tastemakers, we are traveling to western Colorado to visit a vineyard where biodynamics produce wines with pronounced terroir. I'm Kat Neville, and I've been telling the story of local food for about 20 years. In that time, I've seen the American food movement explode in tiny towns and big cities from coast to coast. In Tastemakers, I explore the maker movement and take you along for the journey to meet the makers who define the flavor of American cuisine. A biodynamic farmer approaches the farm as a complete organism with the soil, plants, animals, and insects all contributing to the whole. Here in Western Colorado, Lance Hansen crafts biodynamic wines, as well as organic eau de vie, brandy, gin, and other beverages that express the character of this high mountain landscape. We are here in Delta County on the margin of a margin of a marginal growing area. This is probably as extreme as you could get in terms of a grape growing region here in the United States. We have an opportunity to create products that, you know, that are really unique. And so that's why we're here. So Jackrabbit Hill from the start has always been organic. And we went down the biodynamic path. In 2004, I read this wonderful book called uh, Secrets of the Soil. Reading that really made me feel like this is something we could do. This was something that had the potential to go mainstream. biodynamic farm, but what specifically, what is biodynamic farming? So biodynamic farming is, is a type of organic farming. So just like any other organic farm, we, we want to stay away from synthetic inputs. We want to use compost. We want to use things to, to farm with for fertility, for uh, pest pressure that are found in nature. But we take it one step further. We use what are called the biodynamic preparations. And that is a toolkit of compost starters that we use basically to turn raw cow manure, raw horse manure into really high quality soil, high quality compost. And so when you're saying that you're creating compost using manure and, and these other elements, all of that is coming from the farm. So when you're cutting hay, the hay that you're feeding to your cows is coming from this farm. So they're ingesting what is already growing here and then expelling it in the form of manure, and then you're feeding that back into the soil. So you're kind of creating this loop. That is correct, and that's the whole essence of it, is to create a closed loop that help the soils come more like forest floor-like. Right, if you look around, we don't want to have a lot of bare soil, right? You want to have cover crop everywhere. The reason is that those plants are actually helping the vines, the vines and the cover are in this trading relationship. It's not a zero-sum game. This is all about really amping up the biodiversity. We want as much stuff, 
going on in this vineyard as we can possibly get, right? And that's what the preps are helping us do. That's the cornerstone of the practice. So I would say that sort of the bottom line approach is the application of the biodynamic preps. So we're up at sunrise here on the farm and behind me you can see that Lance and Megan and Lloyd are working on a compost tea. And these teas are really kind of the heart of the biodynamic system. What they're doing is they are infusing the compost into an activated or oxygenated water and then they're going to spray it across the fields. With the term spraying, that is very often associated with chemical specific farming methods, but here you're spraying that compost, so you're essentially micronizing it in a way and making it so that it disperses across the entire field. Exactly. So we're using water as a carrier. By putting the compost in the water, it's a lot easier to apply the compost all over the place. What we do is we add the compost preps that we've made to that water and then we spin it, we stir it up. By stirring it up, we're adding oxygen into the water and the compost preps. And that's gonna activate the compost in the water. They're not only manure, but they're also different plants. So we use things like yarrow, equisetum, stinging nettle, and all of these things are mixed together. And by mixing them together, then we can create kind of a microbial population in that compost. A lot of critters in there that are going to help the soil get what the plant needs in order to be healthy and produce really tasty fruit. The changes that have resulted from our biodynamic practices have been fairly gradual. We began to notice changes immediately, but they were very subtle. But over time, right, over five, 10 uh, years, we've noticed much bigger changes. These are changes that just have to do really with the quality of the fruit and therefore the quality of the product that we're making with that fruit. You don't have to be a biodynamic farmer to care about soil health. Here at Fortunate Fruit, which supplies Lance with peaches and pears, they use microbes to improve the quality of the soil. We're on a river bottom point bar in Desert Canyon, and the soil here, you might think that Desert soil isn't very good for agriculture or for growing crops, but uh, in fact, there's a lot of mineral content in the soils because they're rather young. If you have the water to irrigate, you're actually in a really good position to grow nutrient-dense, high-quality fruit. One of the things that we do differently here at the Fortunate Orchard is uh, we use a lot of beneficial soil microbial products. Soil microbes are very similar to the way that your gut microbes work, where they help you digest nutrients, um, help your immune system fight disease. You know, any of the billions of soil microbes that exist out there are performing really important functions to the plant. And when you have a, a healthy soil microbiome, they're actually adding nutrients back to the soil, adding organic matter back to the soil, and you have a long-term net positive of what your impact is on the soil. Lance uses our Bartlett pears and our Rosa peaches. He uses them to make peris and eau de vies. He likes the acid profile of the Rosa peaches. And our pears have a, just a really great flavor, and I think a lot of that has to do with the climate down here. We get really cold nights and hot days, and that really helps bump up the sugar content and nutrient content of all of the fruit that we grow. Higher acid fruit is really what you want in distilling. 
Because if you're gonna distill fruit, you want to preserve, you want to uh, really show the fruity aromas. The aromatics are as important as what you're feeling in the mouth. In fact, I think they're maybe more important. A big piece of the whole program is creating products that really, that are a total full expression of this beautiful fruit that we grow, that our grower partners grow. The very first products that our distillery made were brandies. So a brandy is really any distilled spirit that is made by fermenting and then distilling that fruit. And there are a number of types of brandy. So brandy has subgroups. So there is this category of brandy called Eau de Vie that's all about trying to create a real pure expression of the fruit. We think about it in terms of what the experience is when you bite into that piece of fruit. So when you bite into it, what are you tasting? Well, you're tasting skin, you're smelling skin, you're tasting seed, you're tasting pulp. So there are a lot of things going on there uh, in addition to the juice, right, that, that are part of that taste profile. So our idea simply is to, is to preserve all those things in the brandy. The way to do that then is to work with the whole piece of fruit. Don't throw the skin and seed out. Put those in with the juice and the pulp and ferment all of that stuff. And in the fermentation process, you're gonna get some really interesting compounds from those solids. One of the products that Lance creates is an Amaro-style bitter, and the key ingredient for this beverage is licorice root. Now, licorice root only grows wild in the aspen forests of Colorado, so we are here to go foraging with Robert. at a not quite 9,000 feet elevation, and we are in a stand of aspen trees, and if you can see all the way around me, it's like this beautiful soft carpet of ferns, and then the plant that we're after, which is the licorice root, licorice right? Licorice root, correct. Yeah, this is, uh, it's just coming into flowering. This is what we're looking for right here. This is a, uh, so we have a pretty mature, Plant, but what we're gonna do is kind of make a circle around and we're gonna lift this up. Because what you're going for is the roots. You're not here to try to get the flowers. No, you really want those just, intact roots. We just want the roots. So you're putting the plant back? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't take it all. Just took part of it. it smells amazing. Yeah. I mean, it smells like licorice, but it also smells like, I don't know, it smells like earth and spice and pepper. That's incredible. And so you didn't take the entire root ball. You didn't take the entire plant. You put parts of this back into the ground so that it could regrow. Correct. I, yeah, so I look for something where several of them, mm -hmm. and then I'm just trying to, as cleanly as possible, extract that one root. Well, when I started wildcrafting, two plants were nearly wildcrafted into extinction, golden seal and echinacea. Two very, very popular herbs. Because of the overpicking uh, and truly near extinction in wild stands, uh, it became one of the most cultivated botanicals. Yeah, I do think that it's really important for folks who 
are attracted to this idea, they need to educate themselves not only on what it is that they're looking for, but how to respect the land in the process so that you don't, you don't disrupt it and it's there for generations to come. One of the products that we've made is Caprock Bitter. And bitter in Italian, the Italian word for bitter is amaro. So what makes an amaro amaro, the key ingredient is a bittering root. And so our amaro uses licorice root as its bittering component, and it can't be farmed. So these are things that you can't cultivate. So you have to go out into the forest to get it. It's 100% grape base. We take the grape, we ferment it, and we ferment it on the skins. We then take that wine and we take a piece of it and distill it. So now we have the wine and we have distillate from the wine. We put those two back together to create what we call a fortified wine. So it's almost like a strong vermouth. And we then add different things that make it an Amaro. Lance grows all of his own grapes for his wines, but for everything else, he sources organic fruit from local growers, including the folks you're gonna meet next here at Ela Family Farms in Hotchkiss, Colorado. Basically in Colorado, we're a little too high, a little too cold. The weather is a little too variable to grow fruit trees because fruit trees need stability. But fortunately, there are some little microclimates around the state, all in western Colorado and mostly in these two counties, where you get these little pockets where we can kind of cheat Mother Nature and where we have the right air drainage off the mesa and where we get some canyon drainage winds and just these little nuances that are really subtle but they mean that we can grow fruit here and we can grow really good fruit here. We do everything fresh, and like for Lance, we're doing it, you know, we're picking them, they're tree ripe, we're getting them up to his tanks, and we're putting them in, and then they cold ferment, so they're not out in the sun, they make sure to keep everything in the shade. And the whole goal is capturing those volatiles and not letting them blow off. And then when they put them in the still, that's what you're catching. And so in O to V, when you, you know, open that, that bottle and there's the peach essence. Those are the fun things that for us to work with him, it's not just a product that you just run through a press. It's actually, how can we grow the best peach so that he can have the most flavor to work with? I think as we talk about systems and growing with soil to tree to fruit to libations, uh, you know, the people are part of the system. The farm doesn't exist without how I run it, or my neighbor runs it, or my mom runs it. And so when you're eating that great peach, you're partly eating a commitment from my granddad and my mom of what is the right thing to do. The soil and the trees are integrated, and so every thought is over 10 years. How are we gonna build the soil? How do we treat the trees? We have beneficial insects and, and really make a system work. And that fruit then comes out of that system and it reflects the flavor of that system. And that's what's so cool is there is no one recipe. And uh, how I farm, how my neighbor farm, that all comes into what this peach is and from this farm and this soil and this sun. And that, you know, that just makes it interesting. All that beautiful organic fruit comes back here to the farm, and some of it is made into whole fruit fermented ciders or parries, but a lot of it comes to the distillery. And rather than making his gin with a grain base like most people, Lance is actually using Ela Family Farms apples. So why apple for the base of gin? Why not another fruit? Our kind of background is in making brandies. So it's really that experience that informs our gin making. And we just feel like we get a really interesting mouth feel when we work with fruit. Fermenting and distilling fruit gives us a rounder, kind of more complex mouth feel in the, in the gin product. Kind of explain to me what the process is, because we can see right now that it's kind of the distillate is coming through the, these little windows. Right. Distilling is cooking. 
it's really as simple as that. Or if you're a really super good chef, it's as complicated as that. But it's, it's very no different from cooking. You start with a pot. The vapor's coming out of the pot up through the closed lid then. The gooseneck, right, is gonna take those vapors into what we call a side column. This is where some of our craft as craft distillers can be applied because we have some gears and pulleys on this thing that we can use to kind of change the character, the proof, how expressive those vapors are. And so from there, it's gonna go through another pipe into a condenser. Remember, this is still gas in here. These hot vapors, once they hit the cold surface area on the coil, they're gonna turn back into liquid. And, and that's gonna, what's coming out here. That's what's coming out of here. This is, this is the end product. is here in Denver at Bardot. We're going to check in with Michael about their extensive bar program. We've seen a rapid growth of the local craft distillers and brewers pretty steadily over the last, I would say, 10 years. Uh, a lot of it has to do with gravitation towards higher quality product and local product from the kitchens. So we've seen a lot of the beverage industry within the restaurant industry shifting towards that same philosophy of locally sourced, locally grown, locally made, attention to detail, attention to high quality. In the case of the wine tapestry program, which is our keg and box wine offering. Really, we're the first in Colorado to do any kind of a keg wine program. I just think it's the ideal way to serve most wines. Colorado is a very environmentally oriented state, so waste reduction is a very important thing to us. So keg wines make sense. It's a zero waste product in the sense that the kegs are reusable, refillable. The wine never turns because it's in a zero oxygen environment. It doesn't become oxygenated and there's no loss there, so we're not dumping anything down the drain. And then we're not dealing with bottles. So it's a very conscious way of serving product. Booze Hall here in the Rhino neighborhood is an incredibly interesting concept where distilleries and wineries are coming together in one spot, and we're going to check in with Josh, its founder. Lance from Jackrabbit Hill and I have a relationship from a biodynamic farming point of view, and I'm very supportive of those practices. This is a pretty interesting concept, which is a collection of Colorado liquor makers who spe specialize in distillering, wineries, ciders, uh, you name it. You can walk in and you can try Colorado Moonshine, you can try Colorado Tequila, which is the mayor of Salida has a rye whiskey that's awesome and he comes up here and it's just a great collection of folks. Each manufacturer has a ta their own tasting room license and their own premises. So within that premises, it's their liquor license. They can only sell what they make, and so they really design the space to fit their brand. Just wanted to bring something in that would just bring a lot more fun to the table right away, and I think spirits is a way to do that. Booze Hall is a perfect fit because it's really taking in the makers that are located throughout Colorado and allowing us to showcase what we can do. I think as a collective, we're bringing a little bit of everything to the table, allowing us to showcase what we can do all around the state. It is our last night here on Jack Rabbit Hill Farm, and Lance has gathered some friends as well as some familiar faces from the episode for a feast. So come along and join us.
Thanks for joining me here in Western Colorado, and I'll see you next time. There's more information on the makers featured in this series, along with recipes and extra videos at wearetastemakers.com. Tastemakers was funded in part by In the hands of those who take pride in what they do, something unique can be created. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. and by Fleischmann's Yeast and A.B. Mowry.